Hello everyone, and welcome to another exciting Pathfinder 2e tutorial stream. Hi there, I am Jason Bullman. I'm the director of game design at Paizo, and today what I thought we might do is do something for GMs. Last week we did a great tutorial um, describing character creation for, for new folks. Today what I'd like to do is chat with all of you about how to create exciting, balanced adventures using the Pathfinder 2e set. And as always, I'm going to be joined by my good buddy, Dan. So let me go ahead and bring Dan in here uh, as soon as I can find it. There it is. Hey there, Dan. How you doing hey, here today? Dan! <laughs> Jason, how are you? What is happening, sir? I knew Dan, you were going to... Yep. La last week I started this off and you were drinking. Planned. Today you're smoking and... Uh, Sorry, I'm sorry. I I, I yeah. didn't get the cue that, that you were going to be breaking to me. I wasn't sure. So today, Dan, what we're going to do is we're gonna we're gonna figure out how to design adventures in Pathfinder Two. Right, right. Yeah, and I can. With, with the caveat to know yeah. that I've never actually run a game before. Uh, I've never yeah. run a Pathfinder game. Uh, I think yeah. I've ran I, I ran one session of Dread, and that was it. Which sure. I mean, that's kind of easy mode, I guess. Maybe a little bit. Super uh, that was fun, that was a easier. lot of fun. So today, what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you through how Pathfinder creates encounters and understand how, uh, you know, you grab monsters and put them in a, into, a, into an adventure and create kind of fun and balanced uh, uh, play scenarios for your group. So I thought, you know, we would start out by just kind of talking just here about what kind of adventure we're going to design. Now, I don't want to get into all the nuts and bolts of designing an adventure. Today, I really want to focus on designing encounters and kind of building them all together to kind of form the encounter map for an adventure. So we're not going to get too far off in the reads, Dan. We're going to skip some things that normally I would cover to talk about, like, here's how you write engaging, you know, introductory text and things like that. We're not going to do any of that. Okay. Okay. We're, we're just going to focus on kind of the, the what, what is usually just kind of the sketch outline of uh, uh, an adventure script. Okay. So to that end, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, let's, let's talk a little bit about a basic kind of story that we can, that we can use. Uh, and, and then from there, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through how you kind of stitch together all the encounters to make a fun story. So I was thinking, you know, because we're not designing a whole campaign here, the best thing to do was just to do like a little sidetrack adventure. Like okay. the players are camping, you know, it's the evening, they've been traveling, they decide to take refuge in a cave because there's a, a storm outside. And they go inside this cave and they decide to rest. And in this cave, they find something else, right? So they go into the cave and in there they find a secret door that leads into a, a larger series of chambers that maybe has some weird shrine in it or something. That's kind of what I'm thinking about as big picture. Okay. So what do, what do you think about that? Just just on the offset. Is there anything you want to you want to talk about that what kind of shrine it is? What kind of what kind of thing we, we'll use some of this to help decide what our encounters are going to be. Um well, I mean, I I I do like the idea of starting easy starting light yeah. kind of yeah. dipping our toe in the in the pool um i mean is it something that we can do where it's not like they're they're necessarily sent out on a thing where it's maybe they stumble across a thing or something like that is that yeah. going to be too difficult no i i think it can be the sort of thing that they just discover and can explore as much of as they want and if it gets too hard for them they can back out it's not a quest they were sent on it's okay. just a a dungeon they can explore so instead of worrying about, you know, what the, their greater motivation is, we don't have a group that we're building this for. So instead, what we're just going to do is kind of figure out kind of some web of encounters and figure out how that all fits together. So, so secret here, I'm going to swap over to the other, the other, the other page here, because I've, I've put together a basic little map for us to work with. And maybe, maybe okay. we should go over to that and take a peek just so that we can kind of think about how we might make this all come together. So I'm going to, I'm going to swap over to that screen and uh, in here, I'm going to go ahead and bring up. So here's what I got, Dan, I've got, got okay. an encounter map and 
uh, you know, I've got I've got a bit of a cave here in the middle. So you got your entrance. That's that's area one. You've got a cave. Uh, that's area two. This is maybe where the party decided to camp initially. And then there's a secret door that leads into some hidden dungeon. Okay. And I I just numbered all the, the rooms and areas so that we can start figuring out kind of what is going on in here. Now, it's important to note that when you're building these sorts of things, the way that I like to start is by creating kind of a web of scenes and, and just kind of planning out kind of, oh, maybe I want to do this as an introduction. Then maybe they explore something else. And I just start kind of figuring out how these, all these things are interconnected. And then usually I use that to make a map, right? Because the, the way that the things are related to each other oftentimes can also be the way that they're actually connected in real life, right? So um, here we've got kind of a, a map with a series of encounters all kind of broken up together. And what I'm looking for from you, Dan, just as an initial idea here, mm -hmm. is, is what kind of things do you think should be in this dungeon? What's the theme? Well, so my, my first question was... Seeing the setup that I'm seeing right here, are yeah. you worried about putting in hooks to make them actually search for a secret passage at this point, or does that come later? Well, I mean, so there's a bunch of different ways you could handle that. You could just okay. have it be a door that opens at midnight, right? You know, it's it's a secret thing that just opens. Or maybe there's creatures in an area three that come out and harass the characters while they're sleeping, and that's how they learn that they're there. Okay. Right? There's, there's a bunch of different ways you could do it. They might just happen to find the secret door, right? So what I'm kind of playing around with here is, you know, is this uh, a dungeon filled with cultists and they're hiding in this cave? Is it a is it a just an old decrepit place filled with undead? Are there goblins or little creatures that live in here? And this isn't a it isn't a shrine. It's it's actually where they live. This is their base. Is it a mm -hmm. hideout for thieves? There's there's a lot of different ways we could go. I just I want you to pick the theme and then I'll I'll walk you through how we start building encounters for. You. Okay. This is my thought. The area two. Mm -hmm. is uh, like, a, uh, like, like a natural enemy, something you would expect to see there. Sure. Right? Um, and then the deeper they go, maybe that's when there's some sort of trap that awakens some undead and all that. So kind of, because I'm thinking build, build the story maybe. And so there's sure. like, you know, I'm seeing snakes. I like this idea. I'm going to run with that. So we've got like <laughs> maybe some snakes, maybe something yeah. scary. Uh, okay. And then, uh, and, and so I figure at first it's like, Maybe this is just an abandoned place that there's got some cool stuff in there. Sure. So instead of it being like an active lair, it's mm -hmm. it's just it's it was a base or a lair or a shrine or something long in the past, and it's been overrun with monsters and now is just kind of a haunted ruin. We can play with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So, um, where we're gonna start is we need to start by having an understanding. That in Pathfinder 2, um, you can approach an, an adventure from a lot of different ways. But one of the best ways you can kind of start the process is understanding the kind of flow and pace of your story. Right? So you don't want to just start designing encounters. You actually kind of want to take a holistic look at the encounters as a whole. Because the players are going to experience them in sequence. Right? So if you just throw a really hard encounter at them right away... They might burn through so many of their resources that they don't want to continue, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding that in Pathfinder 2, the encounter math is very well put together, right? It, if, if, if the encounter math says this is a low threat encounter, it's really not going to be too hard for the PCs to overcome. They will expend some resources. Maybe if the dice go poorly, it'll be harder for them than it should be. But... By and large, you can count on that being an easy encounter. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't throw those at them, because giving the players the ability to kind of stomp some encounters and maybe lure them into expending more of their resources than they should uh, is a way to kind of create dynamic tension in the story. You can just throw the hardest thing at them all the time. But in Pathfinder 2, that's going to end up with dead characters. So the first place you're going to start... <laughs> and trust me, I've learned this from experience. 
because I've I've killed a lot of characters. So, <laughs> what? no. So we're going to start by looking at this chart here. Now, this is the encounter chart. This is chart 10-1 from the core rulebook. You can find this on page 489. So chart 10-1 talks about your encounter budget, right? So encounters get, you know, kind of five classifications here from trivial, low, moderate, severe, and extreme. Now, I'm going to just say that for this adventure, Dan, we're assuming the party is first level. Okay. You you could apply this same math, the same metric to whatever level the party is, but l just to keep life simple on us here, we're going to assume that they're just first level. So that I like means, it. That sounds good. Yeah. So that means when you look at that, right, you start saying, okay, I'm going to throw some low encounters at them, maybe some moderate encounters. You probably don't want to throw much in the way of severe encounters, and you definitely don't want to throw extreme encounters at first level characters. You almost never want to throw extreme encounters at characters, period, because those fights are really hard. That's good for saving up for like the end of a gigantic story where the party has tons of time to prep. Or a little haunted crypt. We don't need any extreme encounters. We mm -hmm. probably want some trivials, lows, moderates. There might be room in here for a severe, depending on how the, the narrative kind of plays. Because okay. remember, our, 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 our concept here is that this is one kind of side trek adventure. So they should probably be able to do it in one session, in one night in game, which means we don't want to expend too much of their resources. So with that in mind, um, you can then start going, okay, let's say I want to build a low encounter. Now, a low encounter says it's it has an XP budget of 60. And it has a character adjustment in there. That's for if you have more than four characters. We're going to assume we just have four. Keep it simple. So if a low encounter has an XP budget of 60, then you start looking at table 10-2. To get an idea of what types of creatures you can spend, you can put in the encounter to spend that 60 XP, right? So if you look at that and you see party level minus one is worth 30 XP, right? Now I said the party was first level, so party level minus one means zero level creatures. So if you throw two zero level creatures at the party, that is one low budget encounter. That is one okay. low difficulty encounter. Pretty straightforward, right? You could also instead get creatures of party level minus two because creature level does go down to negative one. And you could throw three such creatures because those are worth 20, right? And, you know, it, and, and so on, right? If you threw one creature of the party's level at them, just one, um, that would only be worth 40 XP, which would be a trivial, trivial encounter by itself. Now, generally speaking, the game doesn't recommend you throw very many trivial encounters at the players. I think you actually should throw maybe one at the party now and again, just because it gives them a chance to really flex their muscles and just stomp an encounter, right? You know, yeah. they, they, they can really just walk up and beat the encounter into submission. And there's nothing wrong with letting the PCs kind of flex now and again. Right. Do you ever use that as bait to get them to go into something that you know is going to be a little bit tougher eventually? Absolutely. You start, you start off with the, <laughs> the light stuff and they're like, oh, yeah. let's keep going. Oh, yeah. Let's spin that wheel. <laughs> there was there was one skeleton in here. This is easy. Ah, a lich, right? Um, I mean, you know, you can do that. <laughs> that's uh, that's that's being benevolent. That's what that is. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. I yeah. had a different term for that word. Yeah, I guess no, it doesn't it's, mean it, what I thought it means. It's weird. Some people think that words mean something else. They don't. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, so, no. Uh, so... <laughs> So that's kind of the basic setup here. But, you know, so for this adventure, if you're looking for one kind of night of fun, you probably don't want more than about three or four combats. Now we have we have nine areas here. One I think we can kind of discount. We I marked one, area one, just to have a place where in our notes we would be like, the players find a cave. To, to take shelter from the storm, right? And there's mm -hmm. not an encounter there other than they discover this place, and that's the setup. So beyond that, we've got two through nine that we can put some encounters in a bunch of these. Now, we don't just have to include creatures. We can also include hazards. Now, hazards are usually traps. They can be other things. They can be like environmental things. Um, there, there's a lot of things that hazards can be, but the most typical thing is traps. Now, traps don't give the same amount of XP that encounters do. 
So they're over here. And you'll notice that simple hazards do not give a lot of XP, really at all. Now, a simple hazard is something that's just a really basic trap. You try to turn the door handle and uh, an arrow flies from the ceiling to hit you. That's a, that's a simple trap. Complex hazards are things that actually work like combats, right? It's like you're in a room and the ceiling's slowly lowering and there are jet flames coming in and you have to disable a bunch of things and everybody's working in initiative order and it's a big kind of complex hazard. Those are worth more XP because they're more like a full combat. Now, when filling out a dungeon like this, I don't recommend that you usually, you, you take traps and just scatter them around willy. Frankly, it kind of slows up the game. Because the moment the players encounter a trap that's just on a random door, now they're going to check for traps every five feet, right? They're just going to slowly crawl through the dungeon. You've experienced this. You play oh, the rogue. <laughs> guilty. Guilty of that. In fact, I've gotten that look from, from you at across yeah. the table where you're like, nothing still. You yeah. want to keep going? <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's this look from the gym. Yeah, you don't, you don't <laughs> find anything. I checked the next square. Still nothing. Here, let me check. And you don't hear any dice roll. You don't find anything. <laughs> That's my favorite way of letting them know. It's just you don't roll dice and you're like, you don't find anything. Um, <laughs> That's that's the that that's my GM tip from from me to you. Uh you now know my secret. Um <laughs> but traps are a great thing to include in a combat, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a room that has a couple skeletons in it, but it also has a pressure plate in the middle that causes flame jets to shoot up around the outside of the room, uh that's a simple trap. Um but you could add that in with the XP budget from your encounter. Just like it was a monster. So we may do some of that. We may not, but that's how that would work. I would say this. One thing that trips up a lot of folks when they're working with the Pathfinder 2 encounter system is they look at the XP budget for the encounter threat levels and they assume that that budget is set. Like if I'm throwing a low encounter, it has to be 60 XP. It doesn't. It could be 50. It could be 65. As long as it's close, that's fine. And however much it is, that's just how much XP you award the party. Uh, I, I, am, I am famously uh, known for uh, inventing a new encounter threat level between moderate and severe, which is exactly 100 XP, and I call that spicy. Uh, <laughs> spicy. I like yeah, it. All right. Yeah. It's not going to kill you, but you're going to feel the heat. Um, so, <laughs> so who knows? Maybe we'll find room in here for a spicy. So, all right. I've kind of given you the preamble here. This is some of the system stuff. So th the first thing we should do is before we even start thinking about what kind of monsters we want to put in each area, let's instead look at it from the threat level and where we think we might want to place it. So Dan, narratively speaking, you already talked about how area two might have some, some wildlife in it, something that just lives there. Right. Um, I, I'm I'm all for that. That tells me it's going to be some creatures. What? Where are you thinking? Do you want to start this off with a more serious fight, or you want to start it off just kind of easing them in? Well, okay. So this is my thought. I I would kind of like to make it something, and that that's why I was asking about: Do we need to worry about a hook to make them search for the secret door? If that can come later, mm -hmm. then it, I would like it to make sense. We went into this cave, right? There's there's some wildlife there. Maybe some bats. Yeah, uh, I do like the idea of snakes. That would be cool. Sure. Um, I don't know, maybe a, a you know a giant bear. No, I'm just kidding. We won't do that. But you know, like <laughs> yeah, just, just a grizzly, yeah, level just, level four creature, just rips, them, out, rips the pieces, you know? pieces to pieces. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, something like that. Like it's a you know it's a combo of things that would get along in a cave, but don't want to see uh, a, a group of party a party in there. You know. Sure. Well, let's let's plan that for a low encounter then. Something, okay. something soft. It's just some, it's just some animals that happen to live here. Might be snakes, might be bats. We'll look at the encounter tables here in just a moment, Dan, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll uh, we'll see what we can figure out. But let's pencil in area two as a low encounter. Perfect. Okay, so that's our first encounter. We can also we can we can do this by planning forward or backward. Both are are reasonable. 
Now, I numbered these in roughly the order that I thought the players might encounter them, right? So mm -hmm. number nine is furthest away from the entrance. We could jump to there and say, hey, we got to make sure we put something cool in there because that's the last room. Or at least we think it's the last. Right. Um, so we could go there or we could say, okay, do we want to put in a, a monster in three, maybe a monster in seven, five, eight? What are you feeling when you look at this? Because wherever we don't put a monster, we're going to probably put something else it could mm -hmm. be a, a bit of narrative it could be a room with lore like there's some sort of story happening about what this place used to be um it could be an npc right there's someone who's been trapped in here um and something that doesn't you know necessarily need food or water or maybe it got trapped in here recently um mm -hmm. we could put something like that in there that the players could role play with but every one of these should probably be something but only about half of them are going to be combat. So where are you thinking, just looking at the map, which, which areas are you feeling for fights? Well, I'm definitely feeling, I think five would be interesting because you could get some really crazy bottlenecks going on. Sure. Um, and that is, as a player, that, that can be super annoying when you're like, can I get through? Yeah. Please, <laughs> I need to get in there. Um so I think five could be interesting. Sure. I definitely think uh, six might be good, especially if there's an encounter in five and when it's done, then that door that's there that goes to six, if that were like a, a secret passage, let's say, sure. that after they're done and they start exploring, then that opens. If they didn't notice that that was a door, then that opens behind them and something else comes out. Nothing sure. crazy. They just had a bad fight, but yeah. it would keep them on their toes, I think. Um, and then I think three... So, so I'm actually kind of going backwards, like you said. Sure. I, I didn't even mean to, but I'm noticing that I am now. Yeah. I think three should have something that is maybe like, uh, I, I guess you'd call it a moderate thing to make people think, hey, this this wasn't easy. So maybe there's something in here. You know sure. what I mean? Like, we definitely want to keep exploring. So I think three, maybe moderate. Four, maybe there's uh, a place to put in some kind of clues or um, something to decipher that helps them push on farther. Maybe there's something that they need to know that for later. Sure. Uh, then once they get all that, they're like, great, let's go. They get into the, the murder hallway. That's always going to be fun. Um, I, and then six could be a surprise room. Maybe, it, maybe that surprises them after they're, they're done. Um, seven, uh, I, boy, I, so I'm trying to be serious, Jason, but seven, I'm like, can we make that a bar? Can we make like an <laughs> old bar? Um, we could, we could, okay. we could. So the story of this place could be that it was a layer of, some creatures long in the past maybe maybe dwarves lived here and this was once their kind of their kind of private sanctum of a small cult of dwarves and yes. you know we could do something like that and then we could theme the place to be like that but it's no longer like that because now it's it's old it's in ruin and other things have moved in um okay now um Interesting that you, you're thinking five for a combat. I think that does present some interesting opportunities. It is very bottlenecky. So whatever we put yeah. in there, we're going to have to be careful. I also want to note that I, I put some features in here. Um, there's not a lot of dungeon decor in here, and that's on purpose because I wanted you to be able to be like, hey, could we make this a thing? And that's fine. Um, you'll notice that I did put like a statue in the corner of room three, and in yes. room nine, there is an altar. Um, mm -hmm. The detail's really fine, but in room eight, there's actually a portcullis uh, leading out of the room towards room seven. Um, and then there's a door at the other end of that hallway. So between eight and seven, there is some weird sort of portcullis. Why is that there? Was eight being used as a prison cell, maybe? Who knows? Yeah. Um, so what uh, on the, so I guess that would be the west side of eight. What is yeah. that? Is so that that's, a cave? A, that's a spot where the wall is collapsed. Uh, and whether or not that leads to a cave or maybe a tunnel up to the surface, or it's just a small dead end where someone tried to dig their way out. Who okay. knows? That's, that's, oh, okay. that's, that's so something then, we can decide. So then eight can be the, the cell. I, although it does. Yeah. Let, let, yeah. That, that would, that would narratively kind of make sense. Right. Good. The dwarves could have had a cell in here where they kept prisoners. Um, and then nine has an altar in it. Right. It's, okay. it's, it's kind of in the middle of that, that square, that rectangle there, there's like an altar there. So okay. I was thinking that's the deepest spot. Maybe that's something special, right? So, yeah. So our, our narrative here is that we've got kind of a place where dwarves came 
to do some sort of secret magic or rituals. Whatever the reason is, it's now kind of long lost because the place has fallen into ruin and isn't actively being used, and now it's filled with other things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like we're thinking a low encounter for two, maybe a moderate encounter for three, mm -hmm. another encounter for five. This one might be a good place to put some traps in as well. Right, because you've got all those niches and stuff, and yeah. you know that long corridor. I think is part of five as well, right? So, where that encounter happens, it's kind of anywhere in that space. Um, so seven, maybe the maybe the trap would is what would trigger the door to six. Could be and unleash unleash another fight. Surprisingly, after they just got through that uh, that whole area, maybe? I got it. So. I think what you might want to do is you might want to say, okay, the area five has some traps in it. And one of the traps opens the door to six where there is a monster. So mm -hmm. there isn't a monster until the PCs start making their way down five, mm -hmm. uh, heading west towards the T junction that heads towards eight, nine. And when they do so, they release a monster behind them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I like that. That that's fun. That makes for a dynamic encounter. That's another thing we're going to talk about here as we kind of plan some of these out is about okay. how to make the encounters dynamic. That's a great way to do it. Now, it sounds like that that kind of solves up five, six. So we have two, three, four, five, and six all kind of figured out. Seven, it sounds like we want that to be a, a bar, uh, which mm -hmm. means it could be a place with maybe a puzzle. Maybe there's some sort of safe in there. Um, or, um, you know, maybe there's just lore about what this place was. It could also be... Uh, a bit of a barracks, right? You could put some beds in there and it's like their living space. There's some bunk beds okay. and a bar, right? We mm -hmm. could add those things to the dungeon pretty easy. Um, eight is a, is a cell and then nine is some sort of shrine. Now, I think you probably want to have a fight in nine and eight might be a good place to have some sort of role-playing encounter. Maybe there's someone still in the cell who isn't dead, right? That the, <laughs> yeah. that the players could talk to. I mean, yeah, yeah. You could you could do something like that. Maybe maybe this place only fell into ruin recently, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe this person is being kept alive somehow. Right, right. Or they they maybe had to leave quickly and just were like, leave the prisoner there. Who gives a shit? Like, let's go. Yeah. Um. All right. So I think we've got a nice sense of the ebb and flow, right? So that's. That's something that's really important when you're designing encounters in P2 because the players are good. You don't want to just hammer them, fight, 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 then nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Then then puzzle lore, puzzle lore, puzzle lore. You want to kind of break it up and give them opportunities to do other things. So, you know, going, yeah, there's a fight at the beginning and then there's, there's another fight following that right up. But then maybe there is a fight, maybe there isn't a fight. It kind of depends on how the players go and what they explore and what they do because there are some choices. So let's start. Let's start building. Uh, let's start building a uh, an encounter here. We're going to start with two. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, a. Uh, uh, I'm on archives of Nethys, and this allows you to kind of look at monsters um, and sort them by level and by book. And I've already gone in and reduced this down to just the first bestiary. So that's all we're going to see, and. I've only allowed it to show me monsters that are between level negative one and three. That's it. Because okay. if we go to a level four monster, it's 120 XP by itself, which means it would probably kill the party <laughs> pretty, pretty efficiently. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. And so here we are. We got this encounter uh, uh, list. Now, Dan, I realize you probably can't see it very well. Um, but you uh, did. I can, yeah, I can kind of see it. Yeah. Okay. So you did say that you were interested in getting um, some sort of animal to live mm -hmm. in the cave. So here at the lowest level, we do have blood seekers. These are level negative one creatures. They're kind of like big mosquitoes. That's not a bad idea. Those would certainly live in a cave. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think eagles make much sense. Flash beetles, maybe. Giant centipedes, maybe. Giant rats, maybe. Um, skeleton, I don't think we want to put in here. Viper might work in here. So those mm. are our, those are our level negative one creatures, Dan. And of the animals in here, we've got 
a viper, so snake. Um, we've got giant rats, centipedes, beetles, or blood seeker. Let's go. Let's go. Viper. We definitely want a snake in there. Okay. So the viper level negative one, which means it's two levels below the party, which means it's twenty XP. Now, the easiest thing for us to do would just be to include three of them. That would okay. be the simplest encounter is to just include three vipers and we're good to go. Um, now we could include something else, right? We could include instead of it just being an ordinary viper. Right, we could include, you know, something else to go with it. Now, I don't really think there's another snake that's going to fit in here. Well, there's the ball python. So, you could have a snake and it's young. So, what you mm. could do is the ball python is level one, which means it's worth 40 XP. And the viper is worth um, 20 XP. So, you could have a pair of snakes uh, living in here. One bigger, one smaller. You could do that. Yeah. Uh, or if you wanted to, you could just go three Viper. Mm, let's change it up. I, I like the idea of changing it up a little bit. All right. All right. So we've got, uh, we've got a ball Python living in here and a Viper. Now it's not like the Viper grows into a ball Python, but for the purposes of our story, it'll work. <laughs> yeah. One's a ball. Right. One's, one's going to constrict <laughs> you. The other one's going to bite you. It's going to be just fine. Now, there is another option that you would have it, uh, available to you. You can make kind of an elite version of the Viper to bring it up a level to zero. Um, you know, we go from negative one to zero, and that bumps all of its stats up a bit. And that's fun, but I don't think we need to do that here. So that is our first encounter. Go back up here. Just make... Go ahead. So encounter two has a ball Python and a Viper. Now you can figure out where you want to place these in here. This would be the spot where you start writing narrative. I think this is also a good time to recognize that you're going to want to look at ways to make the encounter kind of dynamic. Um, and this room already has some changes in terrain on it. It's got area two already has kind of a ledge and it's got this kind of cave in the corner Right. If you look in the southeast corner, there's there's a bit of a cave there. Um, so you could have the snake hiding in there and the ball python, at least, and then waiting for the characters to make camp before it attacks. Right. You mm -hmm. could at least mix up how it it's not just sitting in the middle of the room waiting for a fight. Right. It doesn't come out until the PCs strike up a fire and it feels threatened. Right. Right. Um, right. But in, in my in my head, I was wondering if maybe that would be like some sort of a storage closet or something like where maybe they find, you know, some tools or something that not necessarily says there's definitely another room here, but it looks like maybe somebody was keeping some stuff in here. Sure. And then when they see the bigger picture, it's like, oh, that was stuff that was supposed that they would use for that the rest of that area or something, you know. You know, actually, I think that's really great if they if they go and explore that small side cave and realize that it's not natural, mm -hmm. that although it's rough. It clearly shows signs that it's been worked like they carved out that way and we're exploring kind of building out that way, but eventually abandoned yeah. it. And maybe that is the clue that leads them to discovering the all of the marks on the northeast side that leads to them discovering the secret door. OK, OK. Right. I mean, yeah, you could do it that I, way. Yeah, I had a different thing going on in my head. Sure. Uh, but. I do like that too. I was thinking that at night, like, cause I really liked the hook that you said where it was like, maybe at a certain time, a door opens. Sure. Right. And I was like, Oh, that would be cool. But not that secret door. What if it was like the, the one between three and four was triggered somehow and they heard that noise. And it's like, you know, you have to do a, you know, g give me a perception check. Sure. And if people heard it, what, you'd make it, you obviously want somebody to hear it. So it'd yeah. be like, yeah. all right, this is what you hear. And then that <laughs> makes them investigate. But it's like they're they're investigating something that they heard, not, sure. you, know, you know what I mean? Like uh, the motivation yeah. feels different to me, but I don't know. That's No, no, no. I've I, never done this before, Jason. I don't know. Oh, and <laughs> and that's, why, that's why I'm here to walk you through it. So giving the players motivation to kind of self-explore is a great idea. Right. Okay. So if, you know, there are some there are some tool marks in the northeast, but maybe the players don't find it. Maybe they're maybe they right. just they, they don't think to go look at the other walls to see if there's anything here. You could have a thing where 
Um, maybe instead of the door opening, the statue in there chimes at midnight, right? You know, because there's mm -hmm. a statue in, in three, right? You could have something in there make a noise. That is obvious, right? It's like, give me a perception check, but the DC is five, right? Mm -hmm. it's, you're not right. going to fail this. Um, and understanding that, hey, you just heard a weird chime come from the wall, that they're automatically going to start searching then, and then they're able to find the door. And then it's them exploring and not just having the dungeon get thrown at them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So let's move on from two and go to three here. Um, so we talked about maybe having a moderate encounter here. Dan, what are you thinking for this encounter? Well, so I had it in my head. So here's, this really depends on eight because I had a thing in my head for eight. And then, cause I'm also reading chat, which is brilliant, brilliant group <laughs> of folks you have in there. I, so at first I was like, oh, it's just long abandoned and them going in triggers undead, like guardian sure. type things. Right. Yeah. But I do like the idea that maybe uh, that because then I started changing it when it was like, well, eight's eight's a, a cell. So yeah. now it can't be so long abandoned. But people were talking about like a, a ghost or a skeleton oh, sure. that doesn't know they're dead. And that's yeah. what's an eight. Right. And then that could lead to something that's similar to seven. Like maybe there's a, a, a talking thing there. Sure. So that puts that puts dead people back on back on the menu as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Undead or back on the menu. Yeah, let's uh, do it. I, I, so, I I love the idea of it being a skeleton, and I'll tell you yeah. why. Book of the Dead for Pathfinder 2nd Edition introduced a skeleton ancestry. So you can just be playing a skeleton, right? So having a skeleton that's not just mindless is mm -hmm. not a, an unheard of thing in Pathfinder 2e. So because if it was a ghost, it could just leave, right? I mean, ghosts don't have to stay in cells. But if it's a yeah. skeleton, it would still be trapped in there unable to leave it doesn't have to eat doesn't have to drink and maybe maybe that tunnel is it slowly trying to carve its way it's, out <laughs> it's little it's little fingers are starting to wear down because yeah. it's still it's just bone you know so yeah. no it's just oh, got little man. it's just got little nubs left <laughs> I, I feel bad for our little skeleton friend that we've yeah, just made up we've, here now we've got a little nubby skeleton friend okay <laughs> so so if you're thinking undead Let's let's go back to the let's go back to archives of Nethys, and we're going to look at um, uh, the encounter tables here, and we're we're trying to find a moderate encounter. So we have eighty mm -hmm. XP. I don't think we should throw a level plus two creature at them. That's too powerful. But what mm -hmm. we should maybe be looking at is maybe something that's level one, um, roughly, and then maybe there's two of them, right? Um, okay. So so let's go ahead and bring this back up. And let's just see what we have in here for undead. So in the negative one, there is the skeletal guard. Now, this is this is not much of a fight, to be honest. The skeleton guard is negative one. That means it's only worth 20 XP. You could include four of them. Four of them would be a reasonable fight. But I, I would caution against it because skeleton guards are very easily destroyed by one channeled, uh, one heal spell burst. And four mm -hmm. of them just says, use your heal now. So, use your heal now. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Just, it just tells the PCs, this is the fight where you use your heal. Um, so let's take a look and see what else we got. There's a zombie shambler. So they could be zombies. They're a little tougher and could stand up to a heal spell a little better. They're also negative ones. So you'd get four of those. If we keep okay. going down, uh, let's see what other skeletons or undead we might have. We're now into level one. Um, and I'm still not seeing anything. There are ghouls. Ghouls are level one. Now, ghouls are a very dangerous fight. Two ghouls would be would be a, a, a bit of a thriller of a fight against against first level characters. So ghouls are a good option. Um now we're into kind of other creatures. Let me load load the rest of the page. Alright. Um so let's get down here to S and Z and see if there's any skeletons or zombies floating around in here in the ones. Okay, Jason. I I think I figure. I think I know what I want to do. I've, okay. I've got an idea. I've right. got an idea. Let's hear it. So, uh, in that first room, was it number three? Um, yes. Okay. So in number three, that thing that's in the middle. That that's kind of like a, it's like a podium, almost like a like a guard post up. You know what sure. I mean? Like that's sure, yeah. That's where some that's in, and there's like a, a podium there, maybe a, a book with like a an feathered pen and all that kind of stuff. Like a sign-in book? 
Let me finish. All right, all right, okay, all, right all right, I, I, I don't where... want to interrupt your, your creative narrative process. Go. Okay. That's where the ghoul is standing. So if they're okay. able to get in and the ghoul doesn't know, they're going to see the ghoul standing behind that, right? Okay. And then in the back in that that statue, and so that's like, so the way I see it is that that's like a rug underneath it, like a decorative rug sure. in the diamond pattern. And then that square on top of it is like a podium. Okay. Sure. All right. Yeah. Then that statue, I'm going to call that a statue that's in the, the back corner over there. Yeah. Uh, that is the thing that was making noise. And what it did at a certain time, it started having like a clock ticking noise. It was okay. like a clock winding, you know, like it was yeah. self winding and like resetting its gears and mechanisms. Sure. So if they're able to get in without it noticing, it'll be standing behind that podium like it's waiting for them. Okay. All Maybe right. to check in to see if their table is ready. <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm not building a dungeon restaurant, but maybe I'm trying to build a dungeon <laughs> restaurant. I'm just saying. <laughs> because look, I number love four, it. there's some there's some cloaks and, and coats hanging over in number four. It's, pre, it's, a, it's a perfect <laughs> coat closet. You made so this, this for me. So this is some <laughs> secret dwarven <laughs> restaurant that that went out of business uh because they forgot how to open the door or something and everyone died inside like, now they're all when, dead <laughs> their slogan is when you're here your family and where is everybody like everyone just <laughs> left so there's they're not there anymore <laughs> all right all right so uh a ghoul is great uh is a great threat for for characters but we probably want to put in two of them um okay so or, okay so we don't or, think that's too many or alternatively, you could include like two zombies. So the ghoul Ooh, could be yeah. the the ghoul could be like the the mater d, and the zombies could be in four waiting to take cloaks and boots and stuff, and they come rushing out to help once a fight starts. Okay, I'm in. I like that. All right, all right. So four is a cloak room, uh, which offers us a great opportunity to uh, place some treasure, right? Uh, yep. Because it it could have things that people left behind. Uh, on, on the last day that dinner was served here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we can go with that. And then in four, we've got the, the maitre d' who's been waiting for centuries now to check in the next group that's here for a meal, but they, they just haven't, haven't arrived. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. And then the statue in the back is just their timekeeping piece. That's the only way they know that time is passing because it, it, clangs once a day yes and then winds yeah. back up mm -hmm. all right okay uh so we got a dwarven a dwarven ghoul and dwarven zombies um and for those by the way you can just use the standard stats for a ghoul and a zombie and just say they're dwarves it, it doesn't make any difference to pathfinder 2 that you use the stats one way or the other if you okay. really wanted to get into the nitty gritty, maybe you could give them like a slightly slower speed because they're dwarves or, you know, some other little drawback or perk based on the fact that they're dwarves. But you don't have to. You can just say that that's a dwarf ghoul and dwarf zombies and it doesn't matter. So uh, that's that. So if we're recasting this to be like a restaurant, that means that seven is definitely a dining room. Right. And, and you talked about it being a bar. Yeah. So, so maybe that is what's going on there. Um, mm -hmm. And then, so that leads us into uh, the five, six area. Now we did just have a moderate fight. We probably don't want it to be another moderate fight if there's something in here. So maybe right. we look at a low for this to keep it moving along. Um, and uh, what are you thinking now for this area now that this is more of a restaurant? So I think that six could still have potentially a fight behind it, but maybe it's more of like a, a bouncer More, it's more of like a, you know, Oh, someone's getting unruly. Let's, yeah. Let's get what's his face, you know, out here. Sure. Um, yeah. But narratively it doesn't make sense to have a trap in that hallway to open that though. Does it, can we still do that? Well, so what you could do is have six be, I'm, I'm just playing with the narrative. Yeah, yeah. You could have six be the room where the servants are, like mm -hmm. the servers. And yeah. it's not a trap. It's when someone goes down five, they trigger the like bell to be like, hey, servants, come help these customers because they've, they've gone 
a different way. So it's 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 like when you ring a bell for service. It's not a trap that was meant to hurt you. It was meant to summon aid for you. But now, right. <laughs> instead, it's summoning a monster to fight you. Okay, I got. I like that. That's yeah. great. <laughs> So, okay. so if we're doing just one creature, we probably want it to be, and it's a low, we mm -hmm. probably want it to be a 60, 60 XP in total. So this may be one of the harder individual creatures they fight. So it's got to okay. be party level plus one. So I'm going to go back to the, the encounter tables here, and I'm going to go down here to try and find a level two creature that's going to fit the bill. So there's animated armor. Animated armor is just a suit of armor that could be coming trying to serve them. <laughs> That's oh, possible. Oh, I like that idea. That's cool. Possible. Okay. We've got a boar that doesn't make sense. I'm trying to look for things that wouldn't that could survive in here forever. A boar, boggard, no. Bugbear, no. Crocodile doesn't make any sense. Dionysus, Darrow, no. Vampire, not really. Um, there is a ghast. That is a more powerful ghoul. But we kind of just did a ghoul, so probably not that. Um... Uh, let's see. Giant viper, leopard, lizard folk. Uh, there I'm, I'm going to be honest, Jason. Yeah. I haven't heard anything since you said animated armor. There's also a skeletal champion. Oh. That is like I, a super skeleton. You put super in front of anything, I'm going to want to put it in the map. I think that sounds <laughs> awesome. So maybe, <laughs> maybe skeletal champion. There's also zombie brute. Which is, but the problem with the zombie brute, and this is an important part of encounter design, the zombie brute is large. Oh, that's going to be messy in that hallway. And our corridor is only five feet wide. Yeah. So we can't include a large creature. He, they have it, to go into the room to him. <laughs> He's yeah. like, come here. Let come me here. beat you up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's just reaching his hand through the door, shaking it at you. You kids. It's not going to work. <laughs> So this is, this is an important note. This is like, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at a public, even a published adventure and been like, those monsters don't fit in that room. You put four large creatures in a 10 foot by 10 foot room. That, that, that room could hold one large creature. You put four. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so let's not make that mistake. Skeletal champion or animated? I owner? like it. Which one you feel? I, boy, I, I think skeletal champion is probably where I'd want to go. Okay. Uh, that makes, that makes good sense. Um, hold on here. Just there we go. All right, I had just a thing so that I could see level three creatures. I realized I only went up to two. Okay, so we're doing skeletal champion. So we've got a skeletal champion servant in level six or in room six that when the PCs, if they go down area five because maybe they're not supposed to go down area five maybe there's area... there an employees only sign there's like a little chain that goes across and it uh, says employees only there could be like a rotted velvet rope <laughs> yes velvet rope there's Let's a velvet there's a velvet rope right at the intersection but it's rotted away that's their only okay. clue not to go down that way and maybe what it is is that area nine is the private dining room that's the that's the that instead of it instead of it being an altar Maybe that's the private, like, nice dining room, whereas in Area 7 is the, the, the smaller dining room. Now, mm -hmm. this map is already set, and I created this very quickly using my blue tiles. Uh, but I think in this situation, I would probably make Room 7 larger. Like, I would, mm -hmm. I would blow out Room 7, and um, I might even attach a kitchen to it, right, mm -hmm. to make all this make more sense. We don't... Yeah. I'm not going to do that here live yeah. during the video, but... I think that would be a way that you would adjust your initial map. The kind How of did you not anticipate that I was going to make this a restaurant, Jason? You well, should, I, you know, I, I honestly, we didn't. This. We didn't. I, I wanted this to be kind of fun and spontaneous, which means my map doesn't quite fit. So that's fine. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So I feel like we're getting close here. We've almost got kind of everything figured out now. Down five in those niches, instead of putting traps or anything, we could mm -hmm. put statues, right? Yeah. You could you could just have statues of like the the dwarves who run the place. Yeah, um, the chef. Yeah, like like you don't get to meet the chef, but you could go see the statue of the. Um, you know, 
Um, and maybe that's a way to tell the lore of this place too, because the PCs at this point, remember, they haven't seen a dining room yet, but if they see a statue of a dwarf, like holding a cleaver and, and like a fork <laughs> and another dwarf <laughs> yeah. holding up like a haunch of meat, they might be like, what the, where are we? <laughs> what is happening here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I like that a lot. Um, all right. So then we get to room seven. And we, we decided this room doesn't have a combat in it. Mm -hmm. um, but this is going to be, this would be the main dining room, so I'd make it much bigger. And maybe this is the site where everything went wrong in this place. Like maybe somebody poisoned the meal and all mm -hmm. the diners that night went crazy and killed the dwarves and that's how this place went down. Or maybe right? This place just got abandoned, right? There's a bunch of different ways you could play it, but you could have that story be told out in this room, right? So, um, this is a place where I might do lore, um, uh, just kind of a big lore dump of like, mm -hmm. and by that, I don't mean there's a book and you read it. What I mean by that is you learn the story of this place. You learn the lore of this place. and maybe the tragedy that happened here is played out in area seven. So, yeah, yeah, because yeah. because in my head, I'm thinking, you know, there's still, uh, you know, maybe uh, there's I mean, there's got to be like a stash box somewhere because they're yeah. they're charging for this. So maybe yeah. there's that. Um, maybe there's also an explanation as to why a why there's a cell in this restaurant. And maybe they've got like a log book of like where people are or, or who, like who people are, like the staff and all of that kind of stuff. So you could be sure. like, Oh, that, that goal we killed at the beginning, the maitre d', his name was blah, blah, blah. Isn't that, you know, funny. Like to me, yeah. I love that kind of stuff. So, yeah. um, so yeah, I, okay. That would be cool. So maybe there's some records or something. Yeah. There could be records. There could even be like, if, if, if this place went bad in a real big tragedy, like it was like poison food or maybe the chef decided to kill everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, what could actually happen here is you could have, you could even maybe make it a haunt, like which is a type of trap in Pathfinder, where all of these ghostly things start happening, like the, these ghostly diners appear and start eating their food and then choking and dying. And as, it, as it's happening to the, the diners, it happens to the PCs as well. And they have, to, they have to run from table to table and slap the dishes off the plates so that the people stop eating so that the haunt can end, right? It's kind I of like that. a ghost trap. You could do yeah. that here. That that would be fun. That would um, be really fun, yeah. So so okay, we know what that is then. And that could be that could literally be trivial. Like it doesn't have to do a lot of damage. Like it could just be a level one haunt, which would be a complex encounter, It'd be worth 40 XP. It 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 doesn't have to be hard, it doesn't have to be deadly. It can just tell the story. And you can just add that. That's fun. Mm -hmm. So we've got that. And now, we've also got room eight. Now, you could change room eight into the kitchen if you didn't want to draw an extra kitchen on room seven. But I do really love our trapped skeleton friend. I do, too. I like that. Uh, because it does do something really interesting that I encourage everyone to do when they're designing static kind of dungeons like this. Finding a way for the players to have something to role play with is really important, right? So having a dwarf in here that doesn't know that he's dead, that is still waiting for his meal, like even though he clearly already ate it and died, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and is just stuck and doesn't realize it, but is, is otherwise just a skeleton, is a lot of fun, right? Yeah, um, I, like, I like the idea. Uh, I, I do like the idea of having somebody to interact with that's not trying to kill them immediately. Yeah, you know? yeah, I'm right there so with you. that's fun. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, Great. So I think that that kind of solves itself. I don't know if there's anything about that encounter you want to twist or change or add to, but I think it kind of writes itself because that character can also tell them the story and kind of be a tragic figure. here. I, li I like the idea of in case there's something that the PCs didn't find, then maybe yeah. this is a part for you to say, like you can give them that part of the story through yeah. this, you know, uh, just in case if, if they didn't find something or notice something. Well, so interestingly enough, one thing that you could do is create a bit of a you have to explore this place to get to the end kind of puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. So this this speaks to another aspect of kind of adventure design because right, you got encounters, which we've been talking about a lot, and that's kind of the key focus of this this whole tutorial. But an aspect of this is understanding that the mix of encounters with puzzles and lore and role playing is what makes these 
these little sidetrack adventures so much fun. And having a puzzle, and what I mean, I'm not talking about like, here's a logic puzzle to solve. I mean, there's something that they need to kind of clue together to make it to the end. So maybe the door to area nine is locked and it's like a stone door because that's how you get into the private executive dining room. And the PCs have to find a key or maybe the dwarf, the skeleton dwarf knows where the key is. And he can tell them because the key is hidden in a very clever location. Like Mm -hmm. the key is generally hidden in the statue in area three, but you have to know to like go back behind it, you know, reach underneath its armor and pull the chain uh, that has the key on it because normally the maitre d' would take you back here. So they keep the key in that room. The PCs might not find that in their search of area three, but maybe the prisoner knows. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So not, not like a puzzle puzzle, although you could certainly include one of those in here, although I don't think the theme of a restaurant with a weird puzzle in it makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, Come on. I, I, I'm not feeling it. Yeah, there's a chess puzzle in here. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> you, have to, you have to solve the chess puzzle if you want another ale. Um, no. No. Not doing that. I'll just go to Applebee's. Yeah, no, I'll just, just go to Applebee's. Um, so that, that, that's not going to work. Uh, so, uh, then they can get to, to encounter nine and, and here we are, we're designing the final encounter of this place. Now we've had, uh, a low, we've had a moderate, we've had another low, we can throw a moderate or we could even go like, maybe kind of do a spicy encounter here. I wouldn't go severe, Mm -mm. but you could go, you could go 80. You could even maybe creep up to a hundred if you wanted to, depending on what you wanted to put in area nine. What do you, what are you thinking? Well, I mean, I kind of feel like, uh, you know, being like that, this is just a happened upon type thing. I don't think there's any reason to go like super spicy, maybe sure. like two stars of yeah. spiciness, I yeah, guess. Uh, I, I yeah. like how now it's turned into everything's <laughs> restaurant themed, <laughs> yeah, including totally. the encounter design. That's a two star encounter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like, uh, yeah, uh, you know, just because, uh, and, you know, truth be told, the, the really cool thing that they can find in here is like a, uh, a crystal decanter with a really fine whiskey in it. Um, sure. Yeah, no, was, I like that you know, a lot. So are you thinking one dangerous monster or are you thinking, yeah. you're thinking a, a, a couple less powerful monsters? I'm thinking this, and this this is what's in my head anyway, is that okay. the person that runs this thing, the manager of this whole restaurant, right, saw yeah. what was going down, grabbed their favorite whiskey, maybe actually had enough time, but they also ate whatever it was that's killing everybody or were a part of whatever's killing everybody. But they made it back to their, their dining room, their private dining room, and locked themselves in. Okay. And then they and then they died, but much like our skeleton friend up in eight, they don't know they're dead either. But okay. they're just like nobody's getting in here because something's not right. So I have an idea. I want to I want okay. to to play with what you're talking about here. So you'd look through the encounter charts, right? I'm, I'm going to go back to these in, these encounter tables, and mind mm-hmm. you, I'm just playing with oh, slightly off screen. There we are. Um. So. Uh, I've, I've been scrolling through this while you've been talking and, and, mm-hmm. you know, I'm like, okay, maybe a level three monster, right? Like something that's worth 80 XP by itself. That's going to mm-hmm. be a hard fight, right? That's going to be a moderate to severe threat boss monster. But looking at this table, I frankly don't see much in three. That's going to make a lot of sense. There's not okay. very many good undead in here that are going to work at level three. There is a skeletal giant, but it's, it's, it's a giant skeleton, which may be a bit much. And I was like, boy, because uh, it is size large. And there's not like a medium-sized zombie. Now, you could go to other books. That's, of course, a good option. Um, you could take a stat block in here and reskin it. Like, you could take, you know, uh, one, of these, one of these various stat blocks and just say it's something else. You could even take this, the giant skeleton stat block and just say it's medium, right? You can do that sort of stuff. Okay. But I have another idea. I would love to hear it. So the zombie brood is only level two, but it is a large creature. What if the owner of this place, like, realized all of this was going down and realized he was poisoned and just ate all of the food on the banquet table and it caused him to swell up into this giant (laughs) zombie? 
and he can't get out of the room. Right? He's like abomination. He doesn't yeah. know. <laughs> he ate all the food. All of it. Okay. And he can't right. get out of the room. And so I would take the zombie brute, which is a level two creature, and I would give it the elite uh, uh, simple template, which gives it bonuses on all of its attacks. It gives it more hit points. Okay. And instead of kind of giving it uh, uh, too much else, I might give it an ability that allows it to just, like, cone vomit on the party. Oh, right? Because it's okay. a big, giant, gross zombie dwarf that ate all of this poison food and is just able to just kind of blast the party with, with gross, rotten food like once per once in the fight doesn't have to be able to do it a bunch of times just once and it might make everybody sickened and and make them make saves and maybe it does some acid damage as well um you know and it's just kind of a great way to just be like (laughs) (laughs) yeah well look i'm a simple guy jason the monster attacks with vomit i want to put it in the book let's go i i'm i i (laughs) i'm a man of simple pleasures and a yeah, vomiting you know. zombie on player characters is a great way to conclude I the mean, adventure. <laughs> I'm a sucker for the classics. You know me. Exactly, Come on. Exactly. So, and that gets to one of my final points here, is creating a memorable conclusion. And I think if they get to that final room and they see the beverage cart with, like, the sparkling crystal decanters that are still filled with some ancient liquor, maybe it's even magical in some way, shape, or form, oh, right? Oh, yeah. On, like, a silver tray that is also valuable, and that just glistens from across the room. But then standing up from behind the table is this giant corpulent dwarf zombie that promptly vomits on them. I don't think they're going to forget that anytime soon. So <laughs> yeah. I think that's fun. And it I like does... It. It does create an interesting encounter because the players, if they want to be able to fight it, they have to go in there. But some players can kind of stay safe by staying out in the hallway. But maybe the zombie can also spit. Like it can't. It can only maybe do its cone once. But maybe give it a a a, a ranged attack that allows it to just spit vile goo at you. Um, right. That way they can hide down the hallway, but it can still fight them. And you've got kind of an interesting final fight. Now, yeah. Before we close it out here today, I did want to touch very briefly on how to design the treasure allotment. Now, we're not going to go through it for this, because I think that's beyond the scope of what I want to do here today. That'd be a whole other tutorial. But I do want to talk about how treasure works in Pathfinder 2, because it is an important part of understanding how to balance encounters. So table 10-9, which is on page 509, is the the party treasure by level table. And what you generally want to do is look at this table, look at what level your party is, and that's kind of how much treasure you should give them throughout the level. So, you know, if they're first level, you're going to want to give them, and it breaks it down either by total value, so you can kind of shop in the book to give them whatever you want, or it kind of breaks it down by give them this many permanent items, this many consumable items, and this much in just kind of money, or things that are worth money, right? So you might look at this and say, hey, in this dungeon, I have a, a two low encounters and two moderate encounters. That's kind of what I put in here. Plus, it's going to have a haunt. And I probably give out some story awards as well. Look those up in the Pathfinder 2 uh, rulebook. They're in the, the, the GM section. But generally speaking, it's 10 or 30 or maybe as much as like 50 XP. Um, for completing various story things. This is just a sidetrack, so maybe it only has like a 30 XP story award on top of it. But the point is, what you can do is total all that up. So we've got two lows, that's 60. Two of those is going to be total 120. Two moderates is 160. So add 160 to 120, and we are up to 280. Plus uh, a haunt and maybe some bonus XP. So, you know, we're easily ending up somewhere around 350, 300 to 350 XP. That's about a third of the level, right? Because you need a thousand to get to the next level, which means when I'm looking at this total value, that how much wealth I should give out, for this sidetrack, I probably want to give out about a third of the wealth that's there. And that's it. Then you just decide what you want to put. You put it in various rooms. You assign various values to it, and you're kind of done. It's not really that difficult. I think the the hardest part is just realizing that there's an awful lot of choices in front of you. Just like on the player side of things, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of choices 
in front of you. So, Dan, how do you feel about your dungeon? I mean, look, I, I like our uh, our little restaurant uh, that we put together. This is yeah. pretty fun. It's like uh, the diner of the damned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something yeah. dungeons, diners, and dry I don't know. <laughs> nope. We're not going there. No, no. no. All right. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna bring us. I'm gonna bring us back to the two up top here, so we can, we can, we can close this out. Dan. Yes. I want to thank you for coming by here today and working with me on uh, on creating this dungeon. I hope you learned a it was lot. Fun. Oh about... my gosh! I, I like I said, I've never done this before. Yeah. Pro to be honest, I probably couldn't do it again and have it be good. <laughs> but at least it makes sense. You know, like I have a baseline to ask like a question, or, or you know, and kind of know what I'm talking about and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, I, I I feel like uh, yeah, I feel like this is pretty effective. So yeah, that's the thing about Pathfinder 2, right? You know, it's a it's a it's a system that has kind of robust support, not just for the players, but for the GM as well. So we mm -hmm. give you those tools to say this is how you create a fun and memorable night of adventure. And here in just one hour, we've created and kind of detailed out a a, a, a really a pretty fun adventure that might actually be two or even three sessions, depending on how much the players play around with it or how quick they go, you know, there's a lot to do here. So I think yeah. this was a lot of fun and I want to thank you for stopping by, uh, to work it out with me. Absolutely, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for work walking me through it. That was fun. All right, everybody. That's going to do it for this tutorial. I want to thank you all for stopping by to watch, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to do more of these. Leave uh, leave comments down below about uh, other videos that you'd like to see. I'd be happy to make some more. Uh, folks have really been enjoying these, so uh, I'm hoping to make some more content. So thank you for watching, everybody, and we will see you next time.